Let me know. And welcome to Wednesday night Bible study here at Expedition Church. Glad to have you tonight and trust you'll be ministered to and blessed. I want to remind you of our weekly services Sunday morning at 1030, Wednesday night at 7 o'clock, Wednesday night prayer, I mean Tuesday night prayer at 7 p.m. also. Um, so come and be with us. We are located at 6302 Walter Wright Road in Pleasant Garden, North Carolina. We are 4.3 miles from Interstate 85 um, at the Elm Eugene exit, exit 124. We'd love to have you come and be with us. You can visit us at expeditiontriad.org. Um, you can go to our Facebook page at Expedition Triad, and we just love to have you with us. Praise God. Have a good and, and just enjoy the service tonight. Uh, as we get started, I want to remind you uh, that Sunday is our collection day for all the canned goods for Urban Ministries. So if you are uh, planning on bringing something, haven't brought something, want to bring more, what you see in the hallway is what we've gathered so much. So far, we want to go ahead and get that up and uh, take a good, nice uh, amount over there. Their, their giving is down, their need base is up, and so they need more help. Okay, so we want to help um, at this time of the year. So we would appreciate you going ahead, you know, a case of beans or, you know, whatever, any, any non-perishable, any non-perishable goods. Okay, that goes with I mean, instant grits, you, you know, macaroni and cheese, canned goods, anything that's non-perishable, um, uh, bring that. And then they supply the other stuff in between. They fill in the, the perishables, okay? All right. Um, before we get started, Sergio, good to have you tonight with us. He's been riding by and uh, see it, saw it. he thought he would drop in and check us out. And um, sorry they want to have more people here for you to check out, but they're, I mean, I got, I'm looking around going, what, what, they're not here, they're not here, they're not, why, I wonder what they... <laughs> We're, we're trusting, we're trusting everything's so good with everybody. All right. So, um, but we're glad to have you. You'll see on the screen scrolling by, uh, it'll say something about, um, guest. You can scan that QR code with your phone and it takes you to our site and all this kind of stuff. Okay. All right. So good. Welcome. All right. All right. Let's go ahead. We, whoop, sorry. <laughs> Haven't worn my ring for a while. I, had, I got it resized. And, uh, I just whacked the podium with it cause I hadn't been on there for a while. And, uh, so, but I got it back on. Isn't that good? Yeah. But I got my wedding band resized too. I couldn't get it off. <laughs> when what happened? Oh, yeah, you know what happened. Gained some weight. All right, over life. All right. We're teaching on redeemed from the, uh, some spiritual death, poverty, and sickness. Foundation text is found in Galatians chapter 3, verse 13, which says, Christ hath redeemed us. From the curse of the law, being made a curse for us, for it is written, Cursed is everyone that hangeth on a tree. And so as we look into that, we want uh, we, we kind of covered this, but you know, it's been a few weeks, so we'll make sure we, we keep tied to our original thought. Um, the, curse, the curse of the fall of man was spiritual death, sickness, and poverty, Okay. When man fell in the garden of Eden, spiritual death overtook him. He became, as one person said it this way, uh, man, uh, Adam was the first man to be born again. He was born from life unto death. Satan became his spiritual father. Okay? He, he went from a living in, in, in union with God creature to alienated from God in union with Satan. God says, uh, Jesus said in John 8, 44, ye are of your father the devil, and the lust of your father ye will fulfill. Well, it wasn't that man was created, okay, with Satan as his father. God was his father. It was the fall that created that state, okay? So Jesus came to redeem us from, number one, spiritual death, reconciling us to the father. Hallelujah. In John 10, 10, he says, I have come that you might have life, zoe, Life in the absolute sense, life as God has it, and that you might have it more abundantly, okay? Or one translation says, live it to the full, or have it to the full. But he wants us to have the God kind of life. Uh, this, the other, the second um, part of the fall is poverty. The ground was cursed, whereas they, they just ate of the fruit of the trees of the garden, of every fruit, of every tree they could eat except the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. For in that day that you eat thereof, you shall surely die. Or as we said before, the Hebrew says, in dying you shall die. Um, it took, you know, took time after he died spi physical, spiritually to die physically. And, and sickness entered into the earth. 
okay? I'm, I'm sorry. Poverty entered in also. Man had to live by the sweat of his brow. Whereas before, he was living out of the, the blessings of the Lord, living out of the goodness of God. And he, did, he wasn't tilling the land. He wasn't doing all that. It was there. And now we know that, you know, uh, living by the sweat of your brow, if you plant in the garden anytime soon, if you don't tend it, guess what happens? You wake up with weeds, really nice weeds. I mean, your, your little vegetable will be down there struggling to survive, and your weeds will be up this tall, lush, you know, big old thorns on them or whatever, you know, the, it, it, the weeds will grow. Why? Because of the curse. See, that's part of the curse. All right? And, of course, we said sickness is the other part, which is the physical part of man is now cursed in this world and may, became susceptible to disease. It wasn't so in the, in the beginning. Adam was not susceptible to sickness and disease until the fall. The perversion of his human spirit perverted his body where it became where sickness could enter in and, and begin to work in it. Okay? So we've already, we've already covered Christ redeeming us from, the, uh, from sickness. I'm sorry, I keep saying sickness. From spiritual death. But let's talk about tonight, let's move into poverty. Okay? Let's move into poverty. Now, according to the book of Deuteronomy, chapter 28, you can look over there. I'm not going to read the whole chapter. It's a long chapter. Okay, but you look, um, obviously we look at verses 1 through 14, and it's the blessings, you know. Blessed you'll be in the city, in the field, blessed in the fruit of your body, blessed in the fruit of your ground, basket, your basket in your store, when you come in, when you go out, when you lie down, when you rise up. Then you get down to verse 15, and, um, or verse 14, it says, and thou shalt not go against, aside from any of the words which I command thee. So Deuteronomy 28, 14. Thou shalt not go against or aside from any of the words that I command thee this day to the right hand or to the left to go after other gods to serve them. Well, number one, the other gods are a god of curse. They're cursed. They're alienated from God. They, they operate, um, the false gods and the demon spirits operate against the things of God. But it's uh, verse 15. But if it shall come to pass, if thou wilt not hearken unto the voice of the Lord thy God, to observe all of his commandments and statutes, which I command thee this day, that all these curses shall come upon thee and overtake thee. Let's stop here for a second. Let's do a little analyzing. Okay? Because you see, when Adam fell in the garden, the earth became cursed. Because why? Satan is cursed. He brings curse. He brings darkness. He brings defeat. That's his nature. John 10, 10, again, we'll quit, quote the whole thing. Uh, the thief cometh not but for to steal, kill, and to destroy. Okay? Those are the three aspects of Satan's operation. I have come, Jesus says, so uh, th they might have life, zoe, life in the li abundant life, life in the absolute sense, life in the manner that God possesses it, okay, and have it more abundantly. And so now we have um, Satan brings destruction, I mean, kills, steals, destroys. His presence, Joe, you can turn that heat down. His presence creates death, it destroys, amen, and it steals. Now, let's look at what he says here. It shall come to pass if you don't hearken to the voice of the Lord thy God, to observe to do all his commandments and his statutes, which I commanded this day, that all these curses shall come upon thee and overtake. Now, let's stop for just a second and back away from traditional theology. Because, see, we, te we're, we always teach God's going to get you for doing something wrong. But let's look at this from a, maybe more, a more positive position or a more positive angle. God says, I've got statutes and commandments. Now, I'm, I'm, the, the, what's the thesis here? That if you don't, if you turn away from his commandments and his statutes, curses are going to come on you. What's the antithesis? If you follow his commandments and statutes, blessings are going to come on you. Okay? So that's the, that's the antithesis, antithesis to verse 15. It's the opposite. So he's telling them, in, in the, it's kind of, we call this a back doorway. In a back doorway, he's saying, now, if you'll do what I say, you're going to be blessed. But if you don't, this is what's going to happen. Why? Because Satan is tied to all the stuff of disobedience. Satan is tied to the disobedience of 
going against the commandments and the statutes of God. When you do that which is against the commandments and statutes of God, it's not that God goes, zap! It is you remove yourself out from under the domain of his protection and blessings of obedience to those things and put yourself under the consequences of obedience to Satan. Because when you don't do the, the, the commandments or statutes of God, then you are listening to Satan. You're following after his purposes, his desire, his will. And everything he touches kills, steals, and destroys. Okay? So it's a curse. So God's not, God's not waiting for, you know, Sergio to, you know, well, I'm not going to do what God told me today. And God's just waiting. To, I mean, he's up in heaven. Man, I wouldn't do that for you, man. You know, lightning's going to come down, all this. He just removes it, and you put yourself right over under a cursed system. You immediately, you, you leave God's system of blessing, and you place yourself under a system of cursing by disobedience to his commandments and statutes. It's not that God's got this reward system or this, God, you know, yeah, your reward system of if you do it the way I say do it, then you're going to get all the goodies. But man, if you don't, I'm going to tell you we're going to we're going to I'm going to jack you up, and I'm going to I'm, I'm just coming after you. It is where you're standing. All right. Um, you you can be you know this is old Pentecostal saying in church, uh, get under the spout where the glory comes out. Well, I want to be under the spout where the glory comes out. I want to be under the spout where the blessings are coming out. But if you're not under that spout, then it's not going to get on you. Okay? So he says all these curses will come on you, and then he begins to tell you what they are. And they're exactly opposite of verse 1 through 14. You know? Um, Cursed shalt thou be in the city, cursed shalt thou be in the field, cursed shall be thy basket, thy store, cursed shall be the fruit of thy body, the fruit of thy land, the increase of thy kind, the flocks of thy sheep. Cursed shalt thou be when thou comest in, and cursed shalt thou be when thou goest out. Uh, the Lord shall send. Now this, remember in Hebrew, in the King James translation, the Hebrew verb construction is not causative, it's permissive. God allowed upon you cursing, vexation, rebuke, you know, all you set your hand to do. Okay. Okay. It's not that God is making it happen. It's that he's allowed it because you've got out from under his umbrella. If we're walking out here in the parking lot at the church and I got a big old golf umbrella and it's pouring down rain and we're standing up under that umbrella and you step outside of it, what's going to happen? You're going to get wet. Now who made you get wet? Why? Well, because the rain was already there. And you were covered from it by being under the umbrella. But when you stepped out from under that umbrella, guess what happened? You got drenched. You ever been one of the rainstorms around here where they got the, the raindrops about that big around, about six of them give you a bath? You know? I mean, it's like, good, great. We were over in Burlington a few years ago. Uh, I forgot where we were, maybe the uh, outlet mall or something. And it started raining about the time we were headed to the car. And I am telling you, we won't with 20 feet away or something. We, I mean, we, we looked like we jumped in a swimming pool. It came down so big and so hard, you know. We, that's not really normal for around here. That's, that's, that's monsoonal rains. That's equator stuff. We don't usually get that, but it was that day. I'm telling you, I, had, I mean, it's like uh, you got to ring out just so you could drive. But you couldn't open the door because if you did, you had to, you had to bucket the water out. It was coming down. Well, if you're under protection, it's going all around you. And you can move that protection around. You can walk around with your umbrella, and it's, it's, it's falling off. However, you can take the umbrella and move it over here and get out front, and you'll get drenched. God's blessings, God's protection is under his obedient plan, obeying his commandments, obeying his statutes. If you get out from under that by not obeying him, you remove that, and you come under the downpour of Satan's killing, stealing, and destroying. Okay? So, this whole chapter is full of all these curses. Christ redeemed us from that. Amen? 
the, the, the curse of the law, the curses that came on the earth, we've been redeemed from, because Galatians 3.13, Christ hath redeemed us from the curse of the law, being made a curse for us, for it is written, curse is everyone that hangeth on a tree. Okay? 2 Corinthians chapter 8, verse 9 says, For you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for your sakes, he became, uh, um, yet, um, yet for your sakes he became poor, that through his poverty might be rich. All right? He wants, now, now listen, folks. I know in the past 20 years or so, we've had, or 30, probably 30 now, 30, well, maybe 35 in, in, in certain circles, prosperity, which I believe in biblical prosperity. No argument with it at all. Okay. I don't believe in excessive. I don't believe in excessive anything in the Bible. You know, some people say that. Say, well, God wants me excessively rich. You're missing the point. And you take any any teaching to an excess, to where it's out of balance with the rest of the Word of God, and you'll get in trouble. Okay. For example, for example, we know from teaching that the. Um, uh, Dad Hagen wrote a book called You Can Have What You Say. Now, that was that you can have anything you say. You can't have somebody else's wife. That's not biblical. It doesn't line up with the rest of the Scripture. Okay? And, and he didn't. He never intended that. People take stuff and run off with it. And, you know, I ain't have what I say. They're believing for your car. They're going to believe for your own car. You know? There's plenty of them on the parking lot, on, on the dealership lot. They're going to believe for one of them. Now I want yours. You can't have mine. Why? Because my faith says I keep mine. One guy told Brother Hagin one time, he's coming back uh, was after Christmas break at Ramah, and he was coming back, and the student walks up to him, and he's getting out of his Ford Bronco. Um, he had a Ford Bronco. One of the board members had given it to him at, at the ministry. And um, the student says, take care of my Ford Bronco. He said, what are you talking about? He said, well, the Bible says I can have what I say, and I believe I received your Ford Bronco. He said, well, I got something to do with it. Yep. And the Lord's already told me what to do about it. He said, what? He said, he told me to keep it. <laughs> See? So you can take anything and push it where a principle is there and take it and push it to an excess, and it gets into error. So we want to stay balanced with what? The rest of the Word of God. Okay? Prosperity. You know, we teach rich. Well, we automatically go to yacht, three houses on the Ri French Riviera, you know, we've got, you know, we got our own private airplane. We've got our own yacht. We've got, you know, a house in the mountains, a house here, a house down at the beach. I mean, we're just, you know, living lasciviously. We're on cruises all the time. We're never doing anything in the church. That's not rich. You, you know, you may, have, you may have all that money, but you, you can be, have all that money and be poor spirit. I mean, poor, destitute spiritually. Remember John said in 3 John 2, Beloved, I pray above all things that you prosper and be in health even as thy soul prospereth. In other words, the balance of your soul being ingrained in the Word of God where you have balance in what you do, it's the heart, it's the motive, it's how it's handled instead of, man, if I ever hit the win that lottery, pastor will never see me again. I might send him a check once in a while. A lot of people say, well, I would tithe. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I know one of the first people who got one of the big lotteries, about, I guess about maybe pushing 30, 35 years ago. Guy was up in West Virginia. Won the, you know, I forgot how much it was. It was like um, uh, 50 or or $100 million. Of course, you know the government gets about 55% of that. He, and and um, he, he told everybody he was going to tithe to his church. As far as we know, he never did. He was going to do this, this, and this, stop going to church, started going uh, to clubs, walked around with half a million dollars in a, br in, a, in a briefcase all the time. Died broke. Granddaughter and, uh, granddaughter and her boyfriend uh, either killed him or tried to kill him over his money. See, you can have that money and it not be used right. So if your heart's not right, you know, it doesn't matter how much money you have, you're not rich. Okay, so uh, I believe in biblical prosperity. I believe God wants you to, to be rich, 
But what is rich? What, how, do we, how do we make that relative to how we're living? Does it mean you're a millionaire? Not necessarily. You could be. Okay? But it doesn't mean that that's what it is. And, it's, and you know, it's, it's not a um, statement about your faith if you're not a millionaire. Okay? Have your needs met? Having more than enough? Giving to the kingdom of God? Able to supply need to in the kingdom, then you're rich. Okay. Now, if you're riding around in a car held together with with a bailing wire, rusted out, you know, I mean, you got your your tires bald bald and uh, as Michael Jordan's head. You know, you know what I'm saying? Then that's not prosperity. All right. You, you need <laughs> if you have a car, you need to have one you can drive on the road. <laughs> Okay, all right. Um, he took our poverty so that we might be rich. Now, yes, Jesus had a treasury. He had more than he needed. He was a destitute. He was a destitute preacher. How do you know he had a treasurer? I can tell you that what's in my wallet right now, I don't need a treasurer. Okay, probably most of you in here don't, based on what you have right now, don't need a treasurer. So Jesus had a lot of money, but it was for ministry. Okay? And so we, we just kind of, we had to come back and balance all of this with the Word of God, not, not compromise. You know, the, you know, God wants some people poor. He doesn't want people poor. He wants them fully supplied. Okay? Um, he doesn't want them living paycheck to paycheck. I know some of us have done that and have done it for years, but, it, you know, God wants to get you to a position that you're in, you're in overflow, but again, what does that mean becomes relative to where you are in faith, where you are in your integrity of your heart? Because I know some people right now that if they became millionaires, they would, they would never be used for the kingdom. Okay? Well, that, mean, that means the integrity of their heart's not right. And even if they got it, they wouldn't be rich. And then I know others that don't have hardly anything that they give, like the widow woman giving the two pence at the um, temple, and she was she went away. You know, she had given more than all the other ones put together, but she gave all that she had. Her heart was a gift to God. Okay. So Jesus did become poor, so that we could become rich. All right. How do we experience the financial blessings of God? Now, number one, stop walking around thinking that. You know, if you give to the preacher who tells you he's got the thousand-fold anointing tonight, which the Bible don't even talk about thousand-fold anointing, all right? The thousand-fold, you know, if you give to me tonight, you know, you're going to experience supernatural debt cancellation. Now, number one, I have an issue with anyone stating that if you give to them, then you're going to you're going to be you're going to be debt free, house going to be paid off, and everything else. And and to have an issue with that because we're to give to the Lord as the Lord instructs. Okay. Okay. If God speaks to you and tells you to do something, you do it. If God says give, you know, and there's an old saying we have. We used, I don't know if y'all remember this. We used to have Pentecostal handshakes. Now Pentecostal handshake is after church, somebody wanted to bless the pastor. They just walked by and shake his hand. When they, when they took their hand back, there was money in his hand. We don't know how much. You, know, you found out later because you didn't go, oh, thank you. You know, they, but it wasn't done. You know, they just wanted to bless the pastor. There wasn't any of this going up and shoving money down their pockets and all in their shirts and, and their coats and all this stuff and throwing it all over the platform and um, everything. Okay? All right? I don't like some of the stuff that we've done. There was a, there was a time before all this started back in the Elden, or late in the eighties. It was the Rolex exchange system. Traveling ministers, and usually they were pastors going to pastors and they were pastoring, going back and forth to their churches and taking up offerings for each other. And they always, everybody had to have a Rolex. Really? They had to have a Rolex. You know, it got so bad that even Ray Stevens came out with a song with, about, with Jesus, wear a Rolex. <laughs> okay? 
And I, I, can't, I, would, I can't imagine Jesus not wearing one if there was one available. Okay? I mean, I, I have no problem with wearing a Rolex. It was the whole thing behind it. Okay? So we had pastors getting up and preaching about, uh, about this giving to the ministries and giving to the preachers and pastors and stuff. And they had them up there declaring they were believing for a presidential. Well, at that time, it was $25,000 to buy a presidential Rolex. I wouldn't want to wear it. Hello? Because I might walk right into a wall and bust a crystal on it. And who knows how much it's going to cost to fix that. You know what I'm saying? And so you had, you had somebody would say, well, I was at a church and somebody came out and gave me the $7,000 Rolex. And he's telling, you know, telling the pastor at the church he's gone to. Then he takes up and gives it to him because he's believing for his $25,000 one. You see, in that kind of setup, you're manipulating people. And so eventually somebody in some church somewhere has got a lot of money is going to go, oh, you know, he's, we're going to bless him and give him a, a, a presidential Rolex. And they do. And it's been, a, it's been a, a manipulative thing, okay? That's not the consistent way to prosperity. Now, now listen, let's, let's take off, just come back off that just a little bit. I am not going to say God doesn't speak to people and say blessed Ministers are blessed people. And yes, it, he does. Okay? But we've got to make sure we're not manipulating a system like the Pharisees at the temple for personal gain. And so I'm dealing with this because we want to make sure that we talk about prosperity. We're talking about within the biblical context, you know, with the, with the parameters of biblical do action. Without a an, a an expectation that's not biblical, that everybody that tithes is going to be a multimillionaire. Well, the wealth of the sinner is laid up for the just, and we—I mean, the great transference of wealth. All the church is going to have all the money at some point in time when when the King of Kings returns. All everything's going to be his. Okay, I don't know that we have enough to say that in this world everybody that's a believer is going to have multi millions of dollars. And then blame it on their lack of faith. Hello. Because they're saying, look at me. Well, I'm looking at you because you've told all the people that, that they got to give to you. And all the people are giving all their money to you so they can get there. Because that's the promise you've given them. Okay. Let's look at this. Giving is the way to experience prosperity. Luke 6.38, Jesus said, Luke 6.38. Now, who's Jesus? He's the second person of the Godhead. He is the head of the church. He is God made flesh. He is Emmanuel, God manifest in the flesh. Amen. So I, I take what he says as fact. Okay? He said, Give, and it shall be given unto you good measure, pressed down shaken together, and running over. Shall men give unto your bosom, for with the same measure ye meet, with all it shall be measured to you again. In essence, the same way you give is the same way you're going to receive. You give liberally, you receive liberally. You give sparingly, you receive sparingly. You give gr grudgingly, you get back grudgingly. Okay? So giving is key in prospering tied together with giving and maybe should have been this should have been first Luke 638 Malachi 310 I mean not Luke 6 Malachi 310 says bring all ye the tithe and offering into the storehouse that there may be meat in mine house and prove me now herewith now stop looking at Malachi 310 what did God say about the tithe? The first thing he said, not that your delights in land, you'll lend to me, may not borrow, not the, the devil be rebuked for your sake, all that. What's the first thing he said? Bring ye all the tithe and offering into the storehouse and prove me now here so that there may be, there, there, that there may be what? 
Me in what? My house. The purpose of the tithe was to provide sustaining income or finances so that the work of God could be done. We took it and began to major on what we got out of it. We're to, first of all, we're to come to fund the operation of the kingdom of God. That's our first motive. Now, God says, if you'll take care of that and do, take care of my house and do what I said, then other stuff's going to happen for you. But we, kind of do, we just kind of blow over that part. Bring you all the tithe into the storehouse that there may be improving out here with, say, at the Lord of hosts. He wants, he wants meat in his house. Okay? He wants to have sustainability for the work of God. Uh, it took care of the priest. It took care of the temple. It ran the kingdom, the earthly kingdom of God's operations. Okay? Bring all the tithes into the storehouse that there may be meat in mine house and prove me now here with, saith the Lord of hosts, if I will not open unto you the windows of heaven and pour you out a blessing that there shall not be room enough to receive it. And I will rebuke the devourer for your sakes, and he shall not destroy the fruits of your ground. Neither shall your vine cast her fruits before its time in the field, saith the Lord of hosts. And all nations shall call you blessed, for you shall be a delightsome land, saith the Lord of hosts. Now, again, the word Lord is in, all, is in small caps, meaning it is the uh, tetragram, okay, of Y-H-W-H, Jehovah, Yahweh, however you, however you want to say it or spell it out. It's a four-letter unpronounceable word but it's translated with the small Lord caps, okay? It means covenant God. God has made a covenant with us that if we will take care of his business, he'll take care of us. That's what he says. That's what he's saying here. You take care of my, my house, you take care of my work, I'm going to take care of you. Why? This is covenant. That becomes covenant language at this point. Okay? It's not an abstract promise. It's covenant language. God, God's making a declaration of a covenant because he's using, it's using the Y-H-W-H in Hebrew, which we translate Lord in all capital letters, okay, meaning I am the covenant God. He is the distinct, unique covenant God. And in covenant with individuals, when covenant is made and covenant is a, as an addendum to the covenant, there is a pronouncing of something. Based on this, I will do this. Okay? God says here, bring the tithe and the offering in the storehouse and prove me now herewith, saith the Lord of hosts. So that, or so there be meat in my house and prove me now herewith. If I will not open unto you the windows of heaven. Now, see, we went and jumped on that. God's going to open up the windows of heaven. He's going to pour out blessings. We're going to have enough room to receive it. We're going to be blessed. Woo! Glory to God. Bless! Oh, hallelujah. I've already conceived that Mercedes sitting in my driveway. Ah. But did you take care of his house? Was your motive to get his house financially stable and in a position that it can do what it needs to do to reach humanity. Because let me tell you something. God is more concerned about bringing the lost into the kingdom than he is that you driving a, a, a Mercedes. Because you could get on just fine with a um, Nissan. You know, you, you, you can have transportation. People can't get on just fine going to hell. And besides, the transportation system of heaven is going to be a whole lot better than any car on earth. There's not a Lamborghini that can stand up to it and match it. And when we saw a little bit of it in the Old Testament, guys riding off in chariots, a flyer, flying off in a chariot. Who's done that lately? Nobody. Okay? And so God's always after your heart. God's always after the intents of your heart. Bring it to my house so there's meat there. Now, meat here is, uh, is symbolic of substance, not necessarily a T-bone or a porterhouse. That would be good. Cooked at Ruth's Chris, brought out on a 500-degree platter. Lovely. 
They brought one out one night and they were cutting it because we were sharing. Because I, I don't get my own steak and Janie don't get hers. We share because it's expensive. So you're going to go all the time. Once or twice a year. And usually because somebody gave us a gift card, we go. Uh, we just don't run over there all the time. Now, I would love to run over there all the time because, you know, it's good. It's good. To be honest with you. But when they cut it on that platter, you saw it. They, they didn't finish cooking it in the kitchen. When they cut it on the platter, you, find, you saw the heat from the platter finish cooking it to the temperature we wanted the steak. Right there just sitting on it. Oh, yeah. Bring it on. Okay. Hallelujah. How did I get off on Ruth's Chris Steakhouse? Oh, it's not talking about meat in the house. It's talking about substance. Talking about finances. Talking about money in the bank account to do missions, to do projects, to reach the community, to reach out to people. Be on television. Be on the radio. Be on whatever means of outreach we're using that there's money to do that with. And I know that's not popular. It's gotten kind of unpopular today to take care of the minister who ministers of the things of God. Okay? Don't muzzle the oxen that trade without the corn, for the labor is worthy of his hire. Especially, uh, it says, um, in the, account, the elders counted worthy of double honor, especially those that labor in word and deed. Okay? So, they that preach the gospel should live with the gospel. <coughs> That's all a biblical principle. Now, that doesn't mean that if you're preaching the gospel, you should have, you should be making, you know, $40 million a year. I mean, at what point, and I have to ask this question because we have to be honest with ourselves, at what point is it not enough? You know? Well, I got, a, you know, $3 million, you know, $30 million mansion. Well, please justify that to me in some way where I can, get, I can see it because, you know, I'm wanting to downsize. You know, my house is too big as it is. All the kids are gone. I want to get a smaller one. I don't, want, I don't want the size house I have. Now, it's not because I want to be poor. I don't have to keep up with all. You know? I don't need a 65-person dining room. I don't have one of those either. Okay? I don't need a 14-car garage. I don't. And I don't need a $25,000 guard dog. Okay? You know, we, we can get into excess with stuff. However, he said he's going to open up the windows of heaven and pour out blessings we don't have room enough to receive. Now, let me say this. Not all tither blessings are money. Let me say that again. Not all tither blessings are money. I, I honestly believe we're going to get to heaven and we're going to basically have like a movie screen for us individually, I, I, that's just kind of, you know, kind of envisioning. And you're going to see all the things in your life that did not happen to you because you tithed. Now, there are a lot of good things happen to you that you could correlate. But there's going to be a lot of stuff that never happened bad because you were living as a tither. Well, you, 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 were, you were going to be in this accident, but I directed you a different way and it didn't happen. Because you're, you're walking in obedience to my commandments and statutes. You're tithing. You're doing what I told you to do. And you were redirected. Or I stopped that guy from going and getting in his car that day. Or whatever. There's going to be all kinds of stuff like that. You're going to find out, man, I could have been dead at 20. Hello? Are you here? So, we, you know, don't, don't automatically equate everything to dollar bills. Okay? Not everything is a dollar bill. Now, not being laid up in the hospital for six months trying to overcome from a wreck that you had um, equates to dollar bills in one way, you know, indirectly. But so the blessings of God, but I'm saying all the blessings of God, quit thinking Robin Leach and the lifestyles of the rich and famous. That's a television show that was on about, oh, I guess it hadn't been on in 20 years or so, but it was on all the time, every week. You know, I, I'm Robin Leach, and we're here with the lifestyles of the rich and famous. Today, we're we're, we're, uh, we are touring Art Linkletter's yacht and his home. Yes. He has the $25 million yacht here in the bay. And everybody's going, ooh. And the Christians hear the prosperity message. I want a $25 million yacht. And 
And it's not that God has a thing against you having a yacht, but do you really need a $25 million yacht right now when uh, there are missionaries who could, who could really be supported by the ministry? Not, there's nothing wrong with prosperity, but when you take it to excess, in other words, here's my thing. If you go straight to what you can get and you never think about the kingdom, your heart's wrong. If you never think about the kingdom or it's the token, well, I'm going to tithe. And then I'm gonna, well, you're supposed to tithe anyway. And if you tithe on 25 million or 25 cents, it don't matter. It's a tithe. It's 10%. You didn't do any more than the person who gave uh, uh, two and a half cents on his, 25, on his quarter. And he probably rounded it up to three because you can't do two and a half cents. Hello? So he gave over the tithe. Are you here? A person that ties on 25 million, 250 million, a billion, hasn't done any more than the person who ties on their paycheck of $300 that month. Because 10% is 10% is 10%. Does that make sense? Okay. That's supposed to go no matter what. Then it becomes the offerings above that and beyond that. If the first thing you bless is you and not God, what's wrong? Okay. Thank you for your enthusiasm. Sergio, can I get a grunt or an amen or something by there? <laughs> Smile? There you go. All right. Um, Hebrew, Hebrews 7, 8 says, And here men that rec did receive tithes, or that die receive tithes, but there he receiveth them of whom it is witness that he liveth. Talking about Jesus. So when we tithe and give, we walk into what? God's financial plan. Now, God's financial plan is blessed. Okay? Now, this is more of a, of, of a tempered message on giving and tithing and receiving. There are some who teach, you know, prosperity, and they teach it well, and they teach, you know, more of you having more. I want to deal with your heart. I'm trying, I'm trying to get your heart. Because, see, you can't handle abundance if your heart ain't right if your heart's not right you can't handle the abundance all right let me give you a natural example get some guy on the streets and um he, he's shooting heroin all right drinking mad dog 2020 if you don't know what that is, that's Mogan, that's MD 2020, Mogan David. We, they used to call it, when I was growing up, call it Mad Dog 2020 because it was a cheap, nasty drunk. That, that, that or Richard's Wild Irish Rose Wine, all that cheapness. And somehow or another, they got a lottery ticket and win $4 million. What do they do? They start drinking Chardonnay. They start shooting up or using designer drugs. They don't change anything. They elevate it just in a different way. Because what? Your heart didn't change. <coughs> One of the things that they, um, we had a guest, they had a guest speaker came to her a number of times named Van Crouch. He was a chaplain for the Chicago Bears, scout for the Dallas Cowboys, personally knew Daryl Strawberry, and tried to minister to him a number of times. He just, he, he, he had gotten into a lifestyle that he just couldn't get out of. A number of times he tried to help him. Personal not just acquaintance, friend. And um, he gave me a statistic one time. It was some crazy number of how many NBA people enter their careers bankrupt. No money. How? Even back in 30 years ago, that they were, they were making, you know, in a career, 10, 15, 20 million dollars. How do you end up bankrupt? Well, here's what it was. You're taking a kid from the hood who never had anything. Everything they ever got, they spent it right then because that's how they had to live. And you took them out of that setting and put them in another setting with all the money they could think of, and they kept spending it with the same way they spent it back in the hood. No limits. Had to spend it all. And just spend it and spend it and spend it. And when they retired, they were bankrupt. 
Michael Jordan started doing some things and different players who had gotten into business and started doing some things to teach the young guys how to save their money. So they had money when, they were, when their career was over, they wouldn't be broke. Okay? You take a Christian, are you listening to me now, who's never had anything, and then let them hear a prosperity message, God's going to make you rich, or you're going to do this, or you're going to do that. And money comes, and they haven't changed their heart and how they do things. Next day, it'll be all be gone. Because the, you know, the home, they, it's not good enough. They want to get a bigger one. That's fine. But you don't have to go from a, you know, $75,000, you know, home to a $14 million home. Okay? you got you got to find... I think John Maxwell says it this way. Find your maximum lifestyle and live there. Find a, a, a max lifestyle that's, that's, that's livable, that you don't have to live in absolute excess. You can be just a blesser and a giver and keep giving and doing things. And uh, did you know most millionaires, uh, they did a study about 30 years ago, most millionaires at that time bought their clothes at Kmart? Kmart! But you got a bunch of people running around trying to buy their clothes at Saks Fifth Avenue and buy designer clothes who don't have any money hardly to try to look a certain look. And they've missed the whole boat. As a believer, we can't miss the boat. God wants to bless you. God wants you to have abundance. God wants you to have more than enough. God wants money in your bank so that it <coughs> if uh, a missionary came in here tonight and said, uh, we're building an orphanage in, um, you know, wherever. Dominican Republic. We're going to build an orphanage in the Dominican Republic. Okay? And um, we need, um, and, and the labor's cheap over there, guys. Cheap. We could build this orphanage for $30,000. And you're sitting there, you know, you got, you know, now you got four or 500000 in the bank, but you're living a maximum lifestyle. Instead of having a $4 million house and all your money gone, you, you got a you know $400,000 house and the rest of it you got over here in the bank waiting to bless. And maybe you say, well, I'm going to give $10,000. I'm going to pay for the whole thing or I'm going to give $20,000, whatever. If we're in that kind of thing, then you're rich. You're rich because you can bless the kingdom of God. It won't, it won't hurt you. You won't be going destitute because you, you help build that orphanage. Amen? So you're rich. I said, you're rich. You're not poor. You're rich. You could do something for the kingdom of God and keep right on going and give somebody else. Someone else comes in. You know, we're traveling. We're traveling this summer and preaching in Bible schools all over. You know, um, the former the former Soviet Union. It's gonna cost us, you know, ten thousand dollars in airline tickets. And once we get there, we got churches that are taking care of us, getting us around. But we need, you know, and you're going well. Here's here's half of it. I got five thousand. You know. Isn't that rich? You got money to take care of that? You're taking care of the kingdom? Helping send missionaries out? Helping take care of the local church? To do the church, you know? So um, by, by giving, by tithing, by having the right attitude, we can walk in a realm of prosperity where we can be a blessing. Amen. Well, all my money's tied up in investments. I can't even get to it, you know? I'm sorry, Pastor, you know, uh, I just bought, bought back into my CDs and that I can't get them out without paying a penalty for six months. Sorry, you need the money right now. What's controlling you? Contro making more money. The money is now in control and not you. Pay the penalty. That's fine if you put them in a CD, and you go, but pay the penalty and take them out early if you need to. I won't make as much money. You know, give and it shall be given unto you. Good measure, pressed down, shake together, running over. God can make up your what you took out. Hello. We, we got to be careful about getting, and, and listen, we don't want to run over here and get back in the other ditch. You know, I don't want any of this whole world's goods. All I want is a log cabin over in the corner of heaven. Well, Jesus didn't say he went to make you one. He went to make you a mansion. All right. Not a log cabin over in the corner, unless you like log cabins. Now, if you particularly like your mansion as a log cabin, he'll give you one. <laughs> All right? If that's what you really want. I mean, if you want a, 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 a what do they call them? Oh, 
container box home. I'm sure you can have one in heaven if that's what you want. Okay, Probably made out of gold. All right? Hallelujah. Okay, so um, then verse 14 of Galatians 3 says this, that the blessing of Abraham might come on the Gentiles through Jesus Christ, that we might receive the promise of the Spirit through faith. God wants to bless you. God wants you to prosper, but he wants to keep your heart right, wants to keep your attitude right, and doesn't want you to get caught up in some of these, um, these things that get you consumed with having all this money and your heart's really not right about it. Dan Hagen did this. He said this um, back late 90s, late 90s, moving into early 2000s. He called all the prosperity preachers of Tulsa to meet with them. Not all of them came. And he told them, fellas, you ain't preaching nothing new. They were preaching this in the 50s. Everything you're preaching, I've heard it all. Matter of fact, and he put his hand on a stack of notebooks and said, I've got the notes from all the meetings when from the 50s. Nothing new. He said they got into excess, killed the move of God, because God was moving at that time. Okay, big move of God going on in America at that time. He said it killed the move of God. He said, I'm determined not to let that happen again. And then he wrote the book, and he was about to release the book, The Midas Touch. Had to hold off a year because they got so, they got so much blowback on the meeting, they didn't want to hear what he had to say. So he held the book off a year before he released it. Midas Touch. See, everything didn't turn to gold. So you got to have integrity. But God wants you blessed. God wants you to have good things. God wants you to live that way. But he wants you to live with the right heart. That there may be meat in mine house. When, you're, when you live to make sure there's meat in his house, he's going to take care of you. Why wouldn't you? If I know that if Ellie, if I can, if I can do things that will bless Ellie, and that every time I need something, she's going to give to it and take care of it, I'm going to bless Ellie. If I know that I give the, uh, I take care of Joe and do things for Joe and bless Joe, every time I need something, he, he ain't got nothing to give because he's using it to, for his next trip somewhere on the planet. I'm going to be thinking twice about how much I'm blessing Joe because I want to put it where it's going to come back and help do the kingdom. God, God's interested in his kingdom. Yes, he wants you blessed. I know I sound like it's double talk. It's not double talk. It, this, is, this is the heart of what you do. Versus just doing. If you don't have the right heart, stop looking for the reward that's given to the right heart. Okay? All right. We're going to finish up right there. Uh, it's time to give our weekly, you know, Wednesday night offering. And um, so, Brother Joe's getting that. If you want to give electronically, you can do so through Cash App or PayPal. And I don't know how long it would take for that to get up there because we don't have, Joe, Bill's not here tonight either. So, um, he can't reach up there and fix the screen. All right. So give electric cash or check, and you haven't ever given, please fill out your name and address so we can send you a receipt. If you don't want it, fine. Just put it in there. Okay. Um, if you're giving electronically at Cash or App or PayPal, um, or you can now give through the church app, but there's nobody here to put that up right now. So I apologize. Father, we thank you for the tithers, the givers. We thank you for the blessings of God. Those who are giving electronically, those who are giving in-house. We thank you that you bless them according to your word. We thank you that they have a right heart. They have a good heart. And they want to see the kingdom of God advance. And because of that, you bless them with abundance. In Jesus' name, amen. Go ahead and receive what's in here. Hallelujah. And then we will let y'all be dismissed. Okay. All right. Thank you all for joining us tonight. Appreciate you being here with us on uh, Expedition Church Live, and we trust that you've been blessed by the Word of God and what we share tonight by the Spirit of God. Remember, we're always here on Sunday mornings at 1030, Wednesday nights at 7 o'clock. Till we meet again, remember these words from 1 John chapter 5 and verse 4, that whatsoever is born of God overcometh the world, and this is the victory that overcometh the world, even our faith. God bless you. See you next time here at Expedition Church.